Hello, um, that's it. Diola Ross and Sniga Asun. My name is Diola Ross, and I'm pleased to finally interview um, Hayden King uh, for this uh, late and short. Um, I've been meaning to want to uh, connect with you for the longest time. Um, I'm a big fan of your politics and um, your policy developments that you're creating. Um, and um, I'm so happy that uh, Ken Moffat has hooked us up finally. I mean, we had conversations via email, but this is like um, so exciting and it's a thrill for me to finally meet up with you. Um, oh, thanks for saying so much. <laughs> so many nice things. I'm, ha yeah, I'm happy read, to, I've read I'm a happy lot to of your articles. Yeah, yeah oh, I've thanks. read a lot thanks. of your work, yeah. Um, so, like I said, the latent shorts, um, I'm just going to go a bit into describing a little bit of that. It's a series about um, academic and um, advocates during the time of COVID um, that is supported by the Jack Layton Chair F uh, Faculty of the Arts and Faculty of Community Services at the Ryerson University. The current Layton Chair is Ken Moffat, who invited me to screen my first uh, film, Twilight Dancers. Um, at the Bimatisewin Life Indigenous Filmmakers in 2018. I had the pleasure of sitting with the amazing Indigenous filmmaker uh, Gail Maurice and an amazing Black filmmaker, um, Natalie Hunter Young. Both are an inspiration to the kind of art I'm drawn to, um, and that is uh, basically putting out anti racist ideologies in my film work. Um, I'm originally from Pemichikama Cree Nation. Um, in addition to my love for the arts, I have many years of frontline experience um, in the social service sector, and I'm a strong advocate for my community. My work focuses on real life topics, issues, or events um, that I'm in. Um, uh, my work focuses on real life topics and issues, like I said, and uh, looking at individuals' daily struggles and triumphs. Being able to speak my own language is important to me, and whenever I get the chance to speak to a Cree speaker, it's the prim primary language I prefer to use. Um, so again, um, I'm so happy that you're sitting with me and you're actually going to have this uh, interview with me. Um, so I, I, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Hayden King. Um, Hayden is Anishinaabe from uh, Beaujolais First Nation and Chiminasing in Huronia, Ontario. He is the executive director of the Yellowhead Institute and an advisor to the Dean of Arts on Indigenous Education at Ryerson University. King has been teaching Indigenous politics and policy since 2007 at McMaster um, in Carleton and Ryerson Universities. Hayden's analysis and commentary on Indigenous nationhood and settler colonialism in Canada is published widely. He is a prolific thinker and a contributor to the uh, national conversation on Indigenous issues. So welcome. Do you prefer Dr. Hayden King or... No, just Hayden is good. Hayden is you good. own that doctor, so I'm going to say doctor. <laughs> <laughs> um, is there anything you want to add to the yeah. to, to that um, before we start? No, I mean, you know that, that I guess that captures it. Every bio is different. I'm not sure where that bio comes from. Maybe it's uh, maybe it's the Faculty of Arts page or the Yellowhead page, but. Uh, I think that about sums it up. Yeah, yeah. I might change my bio after the whole pandemic. And <laughs> yeah, I feel the same way. Like I, that's the same bio that I use for everything. Um, I always mean to think, oh, I'm going to go back on it and I'm going to change it, but I never get to it. Um, but it it captures it captures everything. But I mean, we all mm -hmm. come with so many layers that what can you put in one paragraph? Like. There's so much to, especially with Indigenous people, like, I mean, we could write books of our individual lives <laughs> when it comes to our bios, but yeah. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and um, ask you some of the questions, and I guess you're going to ask me a few questions as well. Um, so the first question I have 
Can you give me your overall description of your work, uh, the work that you do, and tell me what you're currently working on? <clears throat> yeah, I can try. I mean, I uh, have a few jobs. I, uh, I, I run this organization called Yellowhead Institute, which is an indigenous policy research center based in the Faculty of Arts. And that organization really tries to work with community partners to uh, develop the kind of tools and the resources that First Nations in particular need to really push for their visions of jurisdiction and self-determination. So um, for us, that means publishing weekly uh, policy briefs and um, every other month or so we'll pu publish a, a special report on something, whether it's sort of the First Nation Lands Management Act or uh, treaties and the need to implement the number of treaties. Um, we just had a piece on the arts actually and um, arts funding and how it uh, is basically discriminates against indigenous and black and racialized artists. Um, Lindsay Nixon wrote that. You might be interested in checking it out. Mm -hmm. Um, and then, you know, we have this major research that we do once a year captured in our, what we call our red papers, which, um, is sort of, you know, well, it takes a year to produce them. So it's, it's pretty extensive work. Um, so that's sort of what I do on the right, you know, that's my primary job, I guess. Um, but I also work in the faculty of arts to try to recruit indigenous faculty and students into into the to the university through the faculty of arts so for the past three years i've been doing that and um we've increased our indigenous faculty from two to nine over the course of three years and so um we've had a little bit of success with that and um hopefully all the new indigenous faculty that are coming into arts are going to start transforming the curriculum and and the way that we do education Mm -hmm. uh, at the university. And so, you know, on the one hand, I'm working on those, this, the research side of things and sort of trying to, uh, get more community based, um, youth focused, uh, um, accessible research that communities can use on the research side of things. And then my other, uh, my other job at the university is, is sort of trying to really, you know, I think it's an open question whether or not you can decolonize the university. I think probably not, but, you know, you can do some, uh, I think you can do some sabotage at least and, and, uh, and make it a little bit more hospitable for Indigenous students. And so I work on the, on the education side of things doing, doing that work. Um, and then, you know, I'm, I am a re I'm an academic myself. I teach uh, in, in the First Nations Technical Institute program, and I research issues of uh, land restitution, um, the land back movement, um, and look at all the ways that Indigenous communities are reclaiming the land. Mm -hmm. um, I try to do that anyway, and uh, write about it when I can. And... Um, yeah, and now, right now, I, I, I live in a trailer uh, just outside of Alderville First Nation. Are you doing um, are you while doing I, this, uh, van life, van life uh, phenomenon that's been happening? People, people, I don't know if it's van life. It's <laughs> people are like buying buying vans and then uh, you know living off the grid, um, uh, rebelling against the whole. Uh, consumerism and capitalism aspect of life, living. Um, it's intriguing. It's intriguing. But you're in a trailer, so it's not a van. <laughs> it's, it's not a van, but I am, it's part of a rebellion, I think. Um, <laughs> you know, one, one of the ways that this pandemic has affected me and my life is just trying to find a place that is better for my kids. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, fortunately, I'm in a privileged position to be able to do that. Um, but while I renovate this house, which I'm doing myself when I'm not sort of working, working, I live in a trailer. And just on the other side of this one inch wall, my children are bouncing around and doing cartwheels in my, you know, 25 foot long camper. Um, 
Nice. So that takes up a lot of my time right now too. That's that's my pandemic life. Um, but I enjoy it. So that's yeah. good. So you mentioned the red paper. Is that the spinoff of the original red paper? or um, And how does the research aspect uh, mold into that? Yeah. So, you know, in, you know the history in, in 1969, uh, Pierre Trudeau and uh, Jean Chrétien tried to completely transform Indian policy in Canada. Everybody recognized that things weren't working, but they wanted to create, you know, like basically native people are just like Canadians. So let's privatize your land and you can relate to the government the same way other Canadians relate to the government. And we'll do some economic development. And, um, you know, first nation leaders at the time obviously resisted that plan. They said, well, no, we have treaties. We have a framework for our relationship. We want you to honor those. And it was during the red power movement in the late sixties and early seventies that really was revitalizing our languages and cultures. Um, and so obviously the white paper was rejected and people like Harold Cardinal and uh, uh, other indigenous leaders, first nation leaders at the time pushed back and they wrote their own red paper, which was a sort of Indian manifesto. Um, and I think it had its flaws. I think, you know, it was probably a pretty, you know, masculine approach to indigenous uh, policy. And, um, and I think, you know, sort of number treaties historians will I, I think will 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 say that that the 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 our visions of indigenous self-determination have evolved a little bit from there to be a bit to be a bit more inclusive but the spirit of that resistance is what we wanted to try to capture when we started publishing our our red papers mm -hmm. which was really just an indigenous alternative to the you know settler colonial status quo so uh, the time that we're in right now is we have this very activist federal government, uh, not dissimilar from 1969, where uh, there are all these plans for a nation-to-nation -nation relationship and the era of reconciliation. And um, in the most pieces of legislation around Indigenous issues in a century being introduced by this, uh, this past Trudeau government. And um, so we saw that the, the time was very similar to 1969-70. And um, for us at Yellowhead, for all our collaborators that we work with, everything revolves around land. And so our first red paper was uh, called Land Back. And uh, we we're really, really uh, joining this youth-led movement to... Uh, uh, to, to uh, you know, offer this, this, this counter movement, this counter approach, this alternative to indigenous policy. So yeah, you're, you're right. It's based on, it's it, the inspiration for the red paper very much comes from that time of unrest and, and uncertainty and resistance. Yeah. Amazing. So um, how, so just for logistically, once you have it, finished or published at what level can it get to the supreme court or how, how how does that level work without you know just ha not having that knowledge on my on my end yeah uh, how can you, how can well, you that? yeah i mean it's the question of how you influence policy or influence legislation mm -hmm. i think people have been grappling with that for a very long time. I know that indigenous people, the way that we try to influence policy is just like, you know, we'll write you a letter, we'll file a land claim, but if you're still not going to respect indigenous law and indigenous jurisdiction, we'll set up a blockade and we'll enforce our own laws the way that we need to. Mm -hmm. um, but for a really long time, indigenous leaders have been saying, you know, we need an independent organization that can give us the data that we need to go to court or to sit in a negotiation room with federal bureaucrats or federal lawyers and argue our case. Because, you know, sometimes we can make change on the blockade. Sometimes we make it in an office room. Mm -hmm. um, and so for us, we, we do all this research and we provide all this data, data data on injunctions, for instance, the uh, research that was led by my colleague, Sherry Pasternak, um, that has been used in court to push back against, um, you know, the, the criminalization of indigenous people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, 
once we put the research out into the world, we don't really have that much control over who uses it or how they use it. Um, we know that when we did our research on the rights framework, this, you know, this grand vision of a new relationship from the Trudeau government for three, four years ago, um, you know, that was taken up by First Nation leaders and used to push back against the legislation and ultimately cancel the legislation. Mm -hmm. So our research helped do that. And I think that's something that I'm proud of. And to hear young people at, you know, the Assembly of First Nations general meetings cite our research and tell their leaders to, you know, not go down this path. I mean, yeah, that's something I, that I take a lot of pride in. And so how, how our stuff is taken up, how our research, how our, how our writing is taken up. Um, we can't say sometimes it does end up in court. Um, other times it doesn't, but ultimately we're just here to try to, um, you know, really provide the, provide a little bit more of the intellectual sort of ammunition that, that uh, our negotiators and leaders need to, to make the case for um, our freedom and self-determination. Yeah. So would you call that more of a, uh, on a personal note, your own individual protest, so to speak, because what I'm seeing is there's just so many levels and also so much criticism when it comes to protesting in our own communities and also of course how canadians general canadians see indigenous protesters as you know why this again why are they so angry why can't they get over it that type of mentality so that leads me to my next question of you know looking at you know the land protectors and and the warriors on the front lines on the front lines versus other means of protest in your mind is there a spectrum and yeah. level of protesting and what is the right way to protest mm. yeah i think you know one of the things that we try to do at yellowhead is you know we we work with communities a lot we collaborate a lot we provide the information the resources but we're also trying to engage in the conversation with canadians about indigenous issues you know like every week yellowhead will publish an indigenous author that's writing on a particular issue um, and we want to do things, we want to push back on exactly what you're, what you're talking about. So, you know, Canadians will say, oh, it's just another Indigenous blockade. Oh, it's just another protest. Like, what do they want? What do the Indians want? Like, Canadians will ask, every generation of Canadians will ask the same question. 1969, 70, you know, 1982 during the Constitution, 1990 during OCA, you know, the days of action in 2007, like every, every couple of years, we have these flashpoints. And I think we're in one of them now. Yeah. And, uh, and I could be in a cab riding in the cab and they're asking the same question, or I just had dinner with a couple of friends and they're asking the same question. So there's, so yeah, many... like, <laughs> you, know what I mean? yeah. you, get, you get tired of hearing the same question and giving the same answer year after year. Um, but it's this, you know, we want to make it clear to Canadians, like we have the 1996 Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples. We have the Truth and Reconciliation TRC Calls to Action. We have the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. There's been no one that's been studied more than Indigenous people and no issue that's been studied more than the conflict between Canadians and Indigenous people. All the answers are there. Um, you know, they got to be updated for every generation, but uh, the answers are there and Canadians just need to, to really just, you know, crack a book and learn their history. And, mm -hmm. and, and we try to do some, some of the work to educate Canadians um, and take some of the pressure off of, you know, maybe folks like you in the cab that, you know, don't have to <laughs> do that work yourself. Um, but is it a form of protest? I think, you know, through my education and training and then also my teaching I have been taught and I try to teach students to change the way that they think and act in the world so you know some people would describe that as a sort of activist orientation when it comes to education um, I'm not entirely sure I would describe it that way but I, I am interested in transformation I'm interested in transfer I'm, I'm interested in change and if I can do that myself, supporting my own community that's trying to dump, stop a dump site or a provincial park or whatever, I'll go down there myself and, and stand down there with people. Mm -hmm. um, if I can do that through my research, if I can do that through writing op-eds in newspapers, 
Um, if I can do that through organizing at the university and being a diplomat with university administrators, like there are many ways to protest. Um, I do think we get caught up in this structural debate. Um, you know, sometimes, uh, sometimes they'll be like, well, if you participate in the system, then you're just reinforcing the system. So you have to completely disconnect and disengage um, and build indigenous alternatives or, um, you know, uh, uh, alternatives rooted in, 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 in shared visions of, of, of the future among black, indigenous, disabled, queer folks. All that is good and important work um, and should be done. And I contribute to it myself. But often we get stuck in this, this debate you know, that there is only one way to protest, that you can only, the old, there's, 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 there's one way to do things, which is, you know, um, whole scale overthrow of capitalism and the state and uh, 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 misogyny and patriarchy and all those things need to happen. But, but we can, you know, we can do some sabotaging that doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, uh, Everything has uh, everything changes all at once, but we can I don't know slowly chip away and, and, and get to it, manipulate things. So taking that philosophy, I sort of feel that, as I said, there are many ways to protest, and I think in in, in a lot of ways they're equally valid. Mm -hmm. um, I might not find myself signing a lot of petitions, um, you know, I'm but if, if that's skeptical. effective, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, uh, but you know, if 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 it uh, if it supports somebody's campaign, a community's campaign, and they feel that that is, is valuable to their struggle, then uh, then I'm I'm not going to criticize them. And then, like you were saying, it comes full circle with uh, Yellowhead's institution and their mandate in um, trying to make trying to make change in institutions and and creating more indigenous focused and mandated courses. I mean, I guess you, you, uh, University of Manitoba is the only one that has a mandated um, uh, post-secondary, I guess when, you're, when you first get into university, you have to take the course. Um, that is just one university in Canada. It's, it has to be all universities. Because we could say, you know, Canadians need to learn and, and open a book, and, but we need, it has to be forced. And that's, I feel, hmm. is not forced in a way, but I guess when you look at protesting, we're forcing, they see us forcing our way into creating these blockades and, you know, forcing, you know, our bodies in, in showing ourselves in, in, in how we rage and, and our, our anger towards colonialism. That you know, those changes are, are, are important. And I'm, I'm so um, thankful that uh, institutions like Yellowhead are, are doing that and trying to make those changes. Um, mm -hmm. what's, what's scaring me right now is the whole COVID thing, because, um, you know, one of the questions here is, you know, how has your work changed, but how is the protesting going to change in light of COVID? Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, I mean, I could talk all day about how difficult it is now to do community-based research research because you can't get, you know, your community into a room together. And I know that, you know, it's not so easy to gather 25, you know, people via Zoom and try to have a, a conversation like you would ordinarily in a, in a workshop where we can be there in, in person and face-to-face -face and, um, you know, working off of the energy of each other. And, and uh, you know, there's nothing that can replace that. There's nothing that can replace sitting in a circle and having a discussion with each other. And Zoom certainly can't do it. So that's a huge challenge for us when we're trying to do community-led research, community-based research. Um, but I think that the more interesting question is the one that you asked around, you know, what does protest look like during, during COVID? Because, um, you know, in a lot of ways, this pandemic, was really convenient for Canadians. Um, if you remember, right before the pandemic shut everything down, we were having this massive, actually a, actually a shutdown Canada movement. You had the Wet'suwet'en that were pushing back 
against the coastal gasoline pipeline. You had Indigenous youth on the Pacific coast that shut down the Victoria legislature in solidarity. Um, you had the Tyndanega, some Tyndanega Mohawks blocking the, the tracks. You know, Via Rail was shut down. Uh, CN Rail was sh shut down. Mm -hmm. CP, rather. I don't know which of the two. Um, <clears throat> And uh, that was that was building and building and building, and then this pandemic emerges and basically shuts everything down. Um, and the conversation changed very quickly. And and you know, it, obviously, we are in this pandemic, and it's a public health crisis. And whether in our own communities, we have to start thinking how we're going to support people, or if it's the national conversation, or everybody's afraid and anxious and you know where are we going to go at buying toilet paper um yeah. but but it i think it's helpful to remember that right before this happened there was this massive wave of indigenous resistance mm -hmm. and now you're starting to see it you know percolate and emerge again um whether it's on the east coast with the the uh, Mi'kmaq fishers who are battling against the commercial mm -hmm. lobster fishery mm -hmm. whether it's the Gitigan Zibi Nishnabeg who are trying to enforce a moose moratorium against mm -hmm. uh, Quebec sports hunters um uh, you have the blockade at 1492 Lambac Lane the real estate development that uh that uh, Haudenosaunee youth are trying to stop. Um, Sipwetmak women uh, are, are, are building tiny houses in the path of a pipeline and, and being arrested. Um, and now, you know, this is all sort of, this is all coming back and is starting to build again. And, and I think it's really difficult to organize and to show solidarity in COVID times. Um, but, you know, these, these issues are longstanding and they are entrenched and, um, they are going to continue on and, and hope, and hopefully communities can find the balance between, you know, safety and public health and, and continuing to push for these rights. But, uh, I think that the pandemic, all it really did was delay what I think is a pretty significant movement for, for, for land back and indigenous rights that uh, has been brewing for a very long time and is going to continue to go on. Oh yeah, it'll definitely continue to go on. Yeah. I remember, um, I mean, like you were saying, I mean, it, 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 it all comes back. Um, uh, you, you could try to stop it, but it, it, you know, comes back, it comes back, whatever the issues are, it will come back. Um, I remember I don't know more, you know, it just kind of trickled, yeah. it, trickled it just kept going, it just kept going, and um, and it instilled so much pride um, in communities. Um, mm -hmm. So I don't think um, things like pandemics and things like, um, you know, of course, you know, the, the climate, the climate changes, changes and and things that are happening to the earth, of course, you can't ignore that. Um, and it stops people from protesting in certain areas. But mm -hmm. I just feel like people are just starting to mobilize a little bit more. And it's so nice to see um, how we do it from, you know, nation to nation building and, you know, all, all the communities to get together and mobilize. That's another story. Um, and I think you talked about a little bit about the uh, uh, masculinity you were saying about the politics in, in our own communities and how we adopted those ideologies. Um, so I, I, I totally agree with you in, in that sense. Um, but, you know, there's always hope. I mean, I, just, I, I always have that hope. And I'm sure you do. Mm -hmm. And that's why we continue yes. to work. Like we continue to like I'm I'm and I'm in social work and I, I do the same type of advocacy and it's it's the youth that I'm so proud of. Um and I'm so glad that they're stepping up and, and doing that. And I'm I'm so happy that you were saying that they were citing your your research. Because, mm -hmm. um, you know, knowledge nowadays too is like the tip of, your, tip of your fingers people are people are communicating um and that's the positive the pro about having to move into to um forums like uh skype zoom um you know people are mm -hmm. 
conversing and uh, sharing. So you could look at it that way mm -hmm. as well. Yeah. I think those are the questions that I have. I think you have a couple questions that were supposed to be given to me, but. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I, I would, I would be happy to continue along this, this sort of line of conversation because I think that the, you know, the pandemic has thrown a lot of, um, you know, obstacles in our way of, of effective organizing. But, you know, I'm interested in, in your language work and the language revitalization work that, that you're doing. And, um, you know, because this is, this is why we're doing a lot of the protest stuff, right? We're, we're trying to keep the land. We're trying to revitalize our culture and our language that's rooted in the land. Um, but I remember when I was a young man and I would go to my grandmother's house and I was just starting to get interested in the language. You know, my dad was a speaker, but he never spoke it to us kids. Mm. So I would go over to my grandmother's house and I remember I had got a Palm Pilot. I don't know. I can't remember. I must have been like six, 17, 18, mm -hmm. something like that. One of these old Palm Pilots that you just, you had a little um, oh, yes. a stylus that you wrote right, on right, it. Right, right, right. Yeah. And so I took, I took that over to my grandmother's and I would ask her questions, you know, like, how do you say water? And she would just, you know, be like, oh, no, nabish, nabish, nabish. and so I would write it down. Like, how do you spell that? And I often think about that and how technology sort of helps us with the language revitalization. And I'm curious because my work, my language work has sort of dropped off a little bit. Um, but have you found any, you know, are you able to continue on with it through zoom and through, you know, or is it, is it, is it, is it been difficult because since you can't really sit with elders now, what's the, it's, it's funny that, um, how these social media, social media is like completely ironic. It t twisted my mind when it comes to this type of, uh, communication with family back home because I'm originally from Pemichicamac, which is northern Manitoba, so my whole family is there. And um, all of a sudden, it moved from phone conversations to natives just loving Facebook. <laughs> like everybody, every native person is on Facebook. When my mom moved on Facebook, I was like, what? And the strange written communication was com completely foreign to me because it was all oral communication and we never wrote to each other. So having these conversations in writing form on the messenger was quite satisfying in a sense because, um, you know, you know, being connected with family back home, one, but two, um, we were learning as a family that what was taken was not only the language, but also the written aspect of language because all our communication is English because we, we would we write in English, but my mom speaks Greek because she can't spell the language. So it's, so my, my, uh, work has been learning the structure of the language and learning um, the grammar of the language, the pronunciation of the language. So that's a lot of my work. So I'll write a lot of my conversations now in Cree and translate uh, to my family members. So my generation, actually my cousins and, and do the same thing, but it's my mom's generation that kind of needs that uh, assistance so it's it's so funny how you know uh social media has helped with that aspect um like mm -hmm. i grew up learning my language just like you with my grand with my grandmother my grandparents um i spent a lot of time with them my mom spoke it um and so i kept it i left my reserve when i was like young 18 so, you know, I'm 40, you know, I'm in my 40s now, and I still have my language because, um, like I said, writing it and writing poetry in it, um, um, like all these apps as well. I recommend a lot of apps, like using a lot of apps. Um, and, um, and not only that, 
The other thing I do is I actually translate a lot of books, like children's books, for my for my child. Hmm. So, uh, like small, small, like you know, sent me like small structural sentences, and I'll, uh, you know, the label makers. I will just, you know, get that and place a sticker underneath the book for her and we. So we will read in English and also read it in Cree as well. And flashcards work a lot too. So I make my own. You have to kind of be resourceful. So teaching her that. Yes. Um, yeah. And then there's a lot of programs out there um, for early on programs, Head Start programs uh, here in Ontario. They're like pushing for a lot of language um, pr preservation. There's a lot of teachers asking for teachers. I think they're having even ex exceptions for. Um, uh, accreditation so you don't you don't actually need a, a bachelor's of teaching um, degree like you can actually you know if you are a, a, a fluent speaker how many years have you years you've been speaking um, yeah so I I think a lot of my passion is language preservation um, I just wish there was more of it in institutions yeah. And it's because, you know, um, I like to see it, you know, just like French and English being, the, mm -hmm. you know, the official languages of Canada. I mean, indigenous language should be as well. Um, and then, yeah. yeah, that that's an, an incredible thing that you're doing with the translation and the label maker is my kids are um, eight and six and um you know, sort of ironically, when I had kids, I had in my mind, I was like, oh, my, I'm going to, my language work is going to improve so much because I just want to speak to them in the language all the time. And like, you know, we'll, we'll learn together, but it didn't ha happen. It just dropped off because I got so busy, you know, trying to work and changing diapers and chasing kids <laughs> around and, and, and it dropped off. But you have three, right? You have three, just two, three, two, 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 two. Yeah. yeah, I can imagine. Yeah. But I couldn't find anything for like, in our dialect, we couldn't find anything, you know, any books to teach, to learn. They were, they were either all exclusively in Anishinaabemowin or, you know, just not very good. Mm -hmm. uh, so we in different dialects. Yeah, in different dialects, yeah. Mm -hmm. That was an issue. Um, and I mean, you know, we could talk a long time about dial politics around dialects, but, um, <laughs> you know, like I... Uh, we'd make up, you know, you take old McDonald, old McDonald had a farm became like old Mishoma lives in the bush. And then, you know, you talk about like old, old Mishoma lives in the bush. Hoka, hoka, hey, and in the bush, there, you know, there are mangan with, a, ooh, with a, you know, the howl, howl here. So, you know, so you take these, these songs and like transform them, do the best that you can. But uh, yeah, no, the work that you're doing, I think, I mean, if anything, if this pandemic has made me realize anything, it's how much attention and how much um, care we need to focus on our children on things like the language and being on the land. I mean, that's why I live in a trailer like right now, because so my kids can be on the land more, you know, like I think that that is just the critical work that, that the pandemic has made me realize that we need to do. So that type of work that you're doing for your kids. Yeah, that's the antidote to colonialism for mm -hmm. sure. I mean, that's what they're fearing and that's what we have to keep on doing. That's the form of protest that, that you're doing as well. So, yeah. You know what, that, that's the best. What, if you, you asked me earlier what the best form of protest or what the, uh, and I think the answer is um, taking label makers to <laughs> children's books and translating yes. them to decree that is right, my favorite right. form of protest yeah. for sure for sure can you imagine in the in the in the school to be like what are you doing with these books <laughs> yeah well <laughs> that's yeah, no, great. That's great. yeah that's um, that's wonderful so this um, is a question for him but, about viola's work um yeah what is my motivation for my work and what mm -hmm. keeps me going up against so many of these challenges? What keeps me going against so many of these challenges? Um, so I think at the social work, there's two, two parts to it. 
I am, you know, doing social work stuff, but I'm also doing film. Um, I'm a, I, I do documentaries. So I just finished a documentary that won at Hot Docs and also at Imaginative. So we did a short docs. Um, speaking of children, um, um, it's about uh, my partner and I's IVF journey. Um, so I, um, my partner is a white woman and my child is uh, my, uh, I donated the egg and we also have indigenous sperm uh, donor as well. So she carried an indigenous baby. So they really, you know, a lot of the uh, funding and all that stuff really liked uh, the idea of this documentary. So, but my, my goal and my vision of that was um, to show, um, you know, queer families and um, not only that, um, how two-spirited people are um, not having the right, yeah, having the right to have their own families as well and showing how positive that could be. Um, uh, so it was a short documentary based on that. And of course, all those layers of, you know, her being a white woman and how that's going to look and what her responsibility is in, um, uh, you know, um, us raising this baby together. Um, so during that time, I think what made it kind of a little different for me is because a lot of the, the film festivals um, were online. Um, and hindsight, I look back on it and this, I think it's a positive thing because I'm a very, I'm an introvert. <laughs> so it, 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 being, going to these, you know, events and going to these screenings, um, I could do without in, in the film industry. Um, I just like mm. to put information out there. Um, and, and kind of put it up and see where it lands and having those conversations and developing those conversations. So in hindsight, it, it, it was a positive thing, I guess, to, to have it screen online. Um, uh, film work and being in my own bubble here at home works brilliantly because that's the way I write. I mean, I have to kind of mm. be in my own space. Um, so I can't be out there, but, um, like everybody, I feel like it's a difficulty in this. How is it going to look to actually go out of the home and work? Um, because that's what I also do, um, in my other jobs. So, um, mm. I guess we'll see. I mean, I don't, I have no idea. <laughs> well, we're going to see, I guess. Maybe I'll do what you do is go out in, into the bush or something and, um, <laughs> I wish I could. I wish I could. That's like a, a dream of mine to actually go out there and have my own mm -hmm. have my own land. Like I've been in Toronto yeah. for like sixteen years, so um, I think it's like when you have kids, your perspective kind of changes. So I totally mm -hmm. understand. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think we totally went past well, our half hour. Um, but if you have yes. any final thoughts, um, yeah, I get, like a, no. a great conversation. I mean, this could have went on for longer. I mean, there's so many levels, right? Okay. Yeah, I think, I think, you know, especially once we start getting into the, the language conversation. But, uh, I mean, your short film sounds really compelling. Um, so, you know, I, I think I could talk more about that and um, talk more about my work and this idea of protest. And, you know, I guess I get a little bit tired of talking about the pandemic because it seems like that's all we talk about. But it's important, too, I guess. But it'd be nice to forget about it for once, you know, and just like, you know, I'm, I'm, pretend it doesn't exist and talk about things that we're passionate about and that we could do before the pandemic happened, like sit in a room together and have a, a coffee and a cigarette or something and talk about all, all this stuff in, in person. But, uh, right. ah, well, that that just one day. Makes you an optimistic person. Then that's kind of, that's great. That's great. We need, we need, we need to all be optimistic about this whole thing. And, 
um, keep going with our work and keep doing what we do. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, I'll send you a link of the, of Emi Chetoset, which is uh, many bloodlines in Cree. So um, I'll, I'll send you a link and you can watch, watch the documentary. Please do. Please, yes. please do. And uh, keep me posted on your work and I'm sure uh, uh, your articles will pop, pop, uh, pop up here and here and there. So, but uh, I'm a fan yeah. of your work. Okay. All right. Take care. Well, thanks again. Say so, hi to those kids. You too. <laughs> Take oh, well. care. Bye-bye. All right.